A very good afternoon, everyone. I hope you all are doing well. As a part of our new series, welcome to the first episode of Cardiac Master Series, started in association with Marian Cardiac Center and Research Foundation from Pune, under the leadership of Dr. Manoj Zurairaj. These sessions would entail discussions around trending cardiac procedures and developments in India and across the globe. To begin the session, our speaker for today is Dr. Amaresh Rao Malimpati, who is a cardiothoracic and vascular surgeon and unit head and head of department at Nizam's Institute of Medical Sciences in Hyderabad. Dr. Rao is an EC member of the Indian Organization of Rare Diseases and encourages pharma and biotech companies to develop orphan drugs as well. Dr. Rao has an expertise in dealing with explicit clinical cases of cardiovascular origin and is renowned for performing complex heart procedures. There are more than 40 indexed national and international papers to his credit. It is an absolute pleasure to have you with us here, sir. Over to you. Please begin today's session. Hi, everybody. At the onset, I would like to thank the Marian Cardiac Center and Docplexus for this wonderful opportunity to present a wonderful career which awaits all our young students, all our young doctors. It is a cardiovascular thoracic surgery degree. It's not a very considered degree because of so many reasons we'll discuss, but I hope at the end of this, you would have a different perspective and view things in a different paradigm. I'm Dr. Amresh Rao Malimpati. I'm an additional professor and a unit head at the Department of Cardiothoracic Surgery, the Nizam's Institute of Medical Sciences, Hyderabad. So, so many young doctors come to me with this question, which field could I make a great career? <laughs> uh, it's always being a good doctor with a human face will always make so much of difference to your careers. They say there's a lot of opportunity in this area. And I'm sure as young doctors, you would agree that it's a very non-competitive field. Uh, as a little bit of myself, I did my undergraduation and my post-graduation in general surgery from Government Medical College, Nagpur. In between my MBBS and my MS uh, general surgery, I worked in the Nizam, I worked in the All India Institute of Medical Sciences Cardio Neuro Center in the department of CBTS. That's where I was first exposed to cardiac surgery. And that's when I decided I want to be a cardiac surgeon. Then I went into general surgery from there on. And then I did my super specialty MCH from one of India's finest training centers, Institute of Medical Sciences, Trivandrum. And then I was working as a faculty in the Nizam's Institute of Medical Sciences since then after my MCH. Even before my MCH, I worked for a couple of years as a registrar in the Nizam's Institute of Medical Sciences. Then a few years back, I did my healthcare management from the prestigious Indian School of Business. Why I did that? Well, I don't regret it. I wanted to have, a, I had a, because I was in academic practice, I wanted to have a peek into what the corporates think like when they deal with doctors. So I should say that it made a wonderful difference to my career and to the way my thought processes right now. As I said, Nizam's Institute of Medical Sciences is a wonderful institute. We have a wonderful team of young surgeons, of senior surgeons. Uh, we do the entire range. We are probably one of the few centers in the country who practice the entire range of cardiothoracic and vascular surgery. Uh, we do lung transplants, we do heart transplants, we do tracheal surgery, a lot of lung surgeries are done, open, minimally invasive. Uh, we practice a lot of aortic surgeries with aortic dissections. We do a lot of valve surgeries, uh, repairs, replacements, minimally invasive. And then uh, we do the regular coronary work as well, on pump and off pump. So we are in a way, uh, I, I'm very proud to say that our postgraduates are one of the best trained in the country. And they are the ones with one of the maximum employability. And uh, this being a very networked uh, era now, uh, I'm very proud to say that we have one of the highest percentage of retainership as well as uh, number of seats filled for postgraduate surgery. Hyderabad itself is a wonderful city as well. But every year, once the need counseling is done, this is what we get to see and a bit disheartening as well, uh, that there are so many cardiothoracic surgery seats vacant. Uh, almost 100, 150 seats get vacant. Uh, 
Uh, some say that uh, it's because there are so many reasons uh, uh, which are uh, mentioned in the lay press. And then when we ask, the, uh, there are a lot of students who come to us as a part of the general surgery rotation from various medical colleges across, across the country. In fact, uh, we get a lot of people from other states. And when we take a feedback from them, they have, typically have a, a very common standard response. It's a very tough specialty. You have to depend on the cardiologist. Uh, you know, we all say, oh, we don't even want to consider it. There's so much the death and blood. There's no quality of life. Uh, I don't know whether we have a job or not. There's such a steep learning curve and we can't become independent cardiac surgeons very soon. So we don't even consider cardiac surgery as an option. Uh, so they are better off saying, we want to consider other specialties. I don't want to name them, but... Uh, Cardiothoracic surgery, cardiovascular thoracic surgery is not really that much top on these on their minds. Uh, but how do they? How do these students make their choices? They are very bright, young, enthusiastic, very very hardworking, and extremely intelligent kids. Uh, they uh, they have all these things with them. But uh, what drives them to make these choices? Is the exposure which they have to the specialty adequate? No, they don't have cardiac surgery in their institutes. That's why they come to us. Many of them don't even have proper cardiac surgery institutes at their hometowns. Do they have any role models they follow? I remember when I worked in CVTS department in Ames, those people working there were my role models. They would go in the middle of the night, operate. They were fantastic. They had fantastic skills with hands. They had fantastic composure. They were they were phenomenal. So they were my heroes. They were my role models. But here, uh, would you want to make a decision when your exposure is too small or you are exposed to the wrong place? Uh, then there are so many uninformed professionals who do all this kind of loose, loose talk. Oh, CVTS is like this. Oh, CVTS is like that. Do they know it? Do they have that exposure? No. And then there are a lot of other cardiac surgeons within the fa faculty of cardiac surgery itself who say, who are not really know who don't really know what the entire gamut is and they, they say oh i'm struggling in my practice and you would struggle too so you know i wouldn't encourage you to it's a lot of hard work i wouldn't encourage you to they are uninformed experts themselves and they have no business advising such young smart minds about how these what the specialty is all about <clears throat> How would we want? How would we want our career to be? You know, obviously, when you say when you look at uh, practice as well as the extent of training you have, we would all like to have a high training and high practice. We would all like to be in the top right quadrant, and we would all love to avoid the rut of a low training without any practice. Generally, if you go to high volume institutes of uh, excellence probably you wouldn't get paid much, but that would be high training and low practice. So, and uh, generally, if you're practicing in your hometown, immediately after you pass out, you may probably get uh, some patients who walk in, uh, but you may not be offered to, uh, to offer services to the entire range of uh, referral you get, uh, but that would be low tra training and high practice. But eventually, we would all like to migrate to the right upper quadrant. So what path we do, we have to be conscious and we have to be conscious that we don't get into this rut of low training and low practice. How would you decide what to practice? Well, one of the key things is uh, you should have, we should do as a young uh, professional who's about to plan a career, you should map out what your core values, what your core purpose and what your core ideology is. Let's not be judgmental what is good and what is not, but you should be very sure what you want. I know a friend who said, whatever it is, boss, I want to make money. That is my ideology. That is my value. That's my purpose. So he picked up all the jobs which paid money. There's one guy who said, whatever it may be, I want to do work which nobody else could do. That is, uh, I want to be, a, I want to do transplant, which nobody else could do. I want to be the first in my town to do that. And so he pursued those goals. Uh, some guys would say, whatever I do, I would want to just uh, offer whatever services I want to my people at my hometown. Some people would say, I want to be the best in the world in a particular thing. 
So each one of us, we have to introspect and we have to evaluate that what our core values are and what our core purpose is. Why do you call them core values and core purpose? Because whatever may be the temptation, you will not deviate from it. So if I say I want to do a high-end job as my core value, that's my purpose, then no amount of money will make me budge from that value. If you say I want to make money as my core purpose, then no amount of uh, lucrative propositions uh, of, uh, uh, of uh, a better pro job prospect in terms of volumes or in terms of uh, exposure would tempt you away from a high paying, paying job. So let's not be judgmental about what uh, values or purpose you should have, but you should be very clear what your core values and purpose are and stick to it. Because what a lot of people do when they take career choices is, first they say, okay, uh, I want to do go to a high volume place. And then they say, okay, volumes are fine, but I want to go to a place which is just high-end work. So they jump onto there. And then after some time they say, no, no, uh, let me go to a place which makes money. So they jump onto that place. And then towards the end, at the end of say three years, five years, 10 years, you realize that they have neither gained expertise as a, at a place of uh, excellence. They have neither done high volume work. They have neither made or saved so much of money as they would have liked to. Neither they have family as, uh, neither have they put family as a core ideology or purpose and neither could they support their family. Uh, so in the end, they, it's all a hodgepodge and that's when they regret the wrong choices they make just because a clarity to the core values and purpose has not been there. So once you work out your core values and purpose, you should have what your 10-year goal looks like, what your five-year goal looks like, and then there should be a what is called a big, hairy, audacious goal. You may or may not reach it, but that should be the lighthouse for which you are, which, which should be a beacon. But I would say, I want to, I, like I would say, I want to be the, I want to be a, a surgeon who would transplant the pig heart in India, uh, one of the first to do the pig heart transplant in India, if I would say that. And all my actions should go towards that. I should get trained. I, I, I would have liked to do some research in that. I would like to train myself for it. I would collect all the resources for it. So it serves as a goal to which you can keep working towards. And you would want to give a vivid description of that goal to you that this might be the institute where I might want to work. This might be the team I want to have. And this might want to be the success I want to enjoy. So. It's very important to mark out your values, purpose, and your envisioned future as what you would like it like. So, like all, uh, like all people who start young, you would like to have money, fame, lifestyle. You would like to settle early, have possibly your own setup or work as a part of a big setup. Uh, you would like to have uh, recognition of your work and meaningful outcomes. I would like to present a small uh, dual theory, Herzberg's dual theory. Where does money fit in all these things? Uh, and uh, where does the recognition of the work you do fit in all these things? Uh, and there's a, there's a controversial theory. I won't say it's universally accepted, but there's a controversial theory which says that there's certain hygiene factors. What are hygiene factors? Uh, hygiene factors are those factors uh, which uh, if, uh, if they are not present, you'd be dissatisfied. Hmm? But if they're present, doesn't mean that it it ensures a very high level of satisfaction and a very high outcome. But if they are not present, uh, they lead to dissatisfaction and people leaving the work. So salary, the working conditions you have, the kind of relationship you maintain with your bosses, your supervisors, your owner of your business, uh, the owner of the hospital, all these are hygiene factors. These have to be good. Otherwise, uh, guys immediately leave. Um, uh, you. Then there are the motivational factors. They say uh, lack of hygiene is not, uh, I mean, presence of hygiene factor is not necessarily motivation. Motivation would come from what is the kind of work which you do, what is the kind of responsibilities you take, the recognition you get for the, uh, rec for the responsibility you take, what kind of interest you have in the work you do, how you, when you achieve something, the, the praise which you get for all these things. These are the factors which drive you to do the work which you do. These are different. 
how they are different, if the motivation is high and the hygiene is high, that's where we all want to be. Have a fun and exciting job. Hmm? Residency is something like a high motivation and low hygiene, I would say, uh, because uh, high on motivation, because you really love the work uh, or the, you know, uh, the learnings you get and you really uh, enjoy doing new surgeries. But it's low, a bit low on hygiene because uh, working conditions are not so good. Sometimes you can get shouted at by your uh, supervisors. Uh, the, uh, of course, nowadays stipends are good, but in a lot of cases, stipends weren't very good as well. Family has to stay in small accommodations. Mm. But definitely you wouldn't want to be in a low motivation, low hygiene place where you don't get enough work to do, you don't get proper work to do. Uh, there's no recognition for the work you do and there is no uh, hygiene factors as well. Place of work, work is bad, facilities are bad, salary is poor. That's uh, definitely hard to avoid. A lot of people have comfortable jobs. Uh, they have good hygiene jobs, they're well paid. Uh, they get lunch at work and uh, this thing. But they don't do any quality work in the sense uh, RH, RH. So a lot of people, uh, they, they're comfortable, but uh, they find that thing missing. You know, they always come to me and say, oh my God, Amrish, uh, you are doing such wonderful searches. I wish we could do that. Or you have so many good students who are, who are always around you, appreciating you all the time. I wish we would have that. So definitely their jobs are comfortable. Uh, but uh, in a way, there is something unfulfilling. So once again, uh, our effort should be to make it a fun and exciting job. And we should work towards uh, and we should work towards reaching those areas where the motivation is high and the hygiene is good. So does CBTS fit into all these things? Uh, maybe, maybe not. We'll see to if we'll see now. But uh, for those who think it's an imperfect uh, branch, there are so many uh, pros and cons and more cons than pros. I would look at it this way that there is an opportunity in every imperfection. Suppose you're selling a car, a car is worth 1000 rupees and you're full selling it for 1000 rupees. There's no opportunity in it. But what is what is the opportunity? There's an imperfection in which uh, uh, you can either sell it for a 1000 rupee car for 1500 or you can buy a 1000 rupee car for 500. So that's where our opportunities are. And that's where we as young doctors have to find those opportunities in these imperfections. What makes the CVT specialty so unique? Youngest specialties. It hardly started in the mid 50s, and so whereas other specialties started uh, centuries ago, or you may say plastic surgery started uh, a millennium ago. Uh, so this is a relatively young surgical specialty, but uh, even though it has been a young surgical specialty, it has seen full of dynamic surgeons who have challenged the status quo. They have challenged, uh, uh, Bill Roth used to say, if you touch the heart, you will lose the respect of your colleagues, but they challenged that, those norms. And then not only did they challenge it, then they realized that they need to embrace better standards than what the, what the healthcare was following. That's why they adopted aviation and space standards. You know, when you say the checklist, uh, aviation industry or space industry has a checklist uh, wherein they tick mark all the steps or all the equipment and all the steps before they embark on a journey. CVTS was the first to do that. Now, uh, uh, you have now authors advocating the, all these things right now, but we were doing that 50 years ago. We were the first to adopt technology. The, the pyrolite carbon, which was used to make these valves, these were all used, developed for space technology. Uh, the, the hemodynamics of the human heart. We were sharing notes with the uh, uh, oil tycoons and how blood uh, of how oil flows through pipelines. We were following those technologies. We were using those technologies to develop pacemakers of the heart. To, to, uh, to watch trends of how the patient goes. We were one of those, you know, coronary artery bypass grafting is the most reported surgery in the world. It is even more reported than hernia. Can you believe it? So this is the level to which obsessively we have invested into this technology. Uh, it is 
full of interesting anecdotes, full of challenges. If you read the history of cardiac surgery, do spend some time try, trying to read the history. It is full of such wonderful characters. There are a lot of stories of inspiration. It is wonderful. And then if any hospital, why is CBTS one of the keys is that they are the driving force. They are the benchmark for other services in the hospital. I'm very proud to say that my CBTS nurse will be the best nurse in the hospital. My worker in my ward will be the best worker in the hospital. My resident 100% is the most hardworking, best surgical hand, and one of the most empowered resident in the entire hospital. They are a different, they strut around like a different species. They are the benchmarks for other people in the hospital. And then not just patient outcomes. We had that when patient engagement and now you see patient engagement, patient satisfaction, scores given. These have these are new things which have come up. Who started all these things? It was cardiac surgeons who started all these things. You know, uh, there are stories when the surgeons uh, said, why didn't you uh, ask one of the nurses, why didn't you get uh, your relative operated with us? They say, you are a great surgeon, but uh, I find that this, uh, this surgery doesn't require a high level expertise but it requires a very human approach, uh, humane approach. That's when it said, oh my God, we are missing this. Let's be patient friendly. These cardiac surgeons once were the ones who mapped out that when a patient comes to the hospital, what is the number of people they interact with, how many interactions they have, and then they have invested in training each of these interactions with how to behave with the patient and how to make themselves more patient friendly. Remember, this is cardiac surgery, which has done all these things. So for people who say, wow, wow, wow oh, this has a very steep learning curve. It takes so many years to go practice before I can be an independent surgeon. Don't believe them. I probably never worked at the right places. The scenario has changed so much now. Uh, you know, there were times when the cardiac surgeons used to think they were gods themselves. Maybe some of them still do. Uh, but the scenario has changed now. You no longer have to go abroad to learn uh, CABG like the generation before us had to, or even a lot of people in my generation had to. Uh, there are a lot of good people who are in this specialty who are willing to train their uh, juniors and who are willing to mentor them. So never work for a bad boss, that's why. You know, nowadays, this is a network era. Everybody knows which place is good, which place is, is, isn't good. And so you can always pick the right place for training. That's one of the beauties of this specialty now. You can always, you have a lot of choice. You can always pick the right place for training. No, it has become a necessity. There's skills become, uh, which have become very essential for surgeons today. Earlier, it was just that you be a part of a residency program, you come out, practice, and you make money. That was the standard uh, maybe 30, 40, 50 years ago, but not anymore. You can't, uh, you can't uh, just say that I'm a part of a system, I'm a doctor, and I'll make uh, a good career. It is highly imperative that when a patient comes to you, uh, when a patient comes to you, there are so many things at stake. But it's highly necessary that the surgeon today should have good knowledge because patient will Google his, his uh, conditions. He will Google all the surrounding things. He will come with a lot more information, but then you should have the knowledge. And you, when you have the knowledge, you should process that knowledge and have the wisdom to guide the patient. That's when he will value you so much. You know? He will value you because he has so much of information. He doesn't know what heads or tails about what to make out of it. And then you say, then you guide him through the process and that's the wisdom you show. And that's when he will suddenly fall hook, line and sinker to you. There's no doubt that you need to have good surgical skills. How to develop the surgical skills? I'll just tell you in a minute. Uh, communication skills are so important in today's world. Our communication skills, not just uh, in terms of interacting with the patients, but also the way you handle social media. Uh, the way you conduct yourself in the society and uh, talk to people around you, uh, the way you project your skill sets and the way you project your branch and specialty. I'm not talking this of just cardiac surgery, cardiothoracic and vascular surgery alone. It can be any specialty you want. 
All these things are so important. And above all, you should create a concept of value. That means when you are doing a surgery or when you are doing some procedure, you should see value not just for yourself. Of course, you will see value for yourself. Value for yourself will be in the form of remuneration you get for yourself, in the form of fame, name you get for yourself, in the form of how you project yourself in the society. But also, you should have your colleagues should get value in the sense that uh, maybe you finish the surgery in time, you finish the surgery with the minimal complications. That way, the patient benefits more. Uh, the uh, hospital, uh, the hospital also, um, who are the uh, payers, uh, like the insurance companies and all, might also want to benefit more if you are uh, finishing the surgeries without any major complications within a specified budget, if you don't waste too many sutures, if you don't waste too many disposables. Uh, and then the industry partners, they benefit as well because you do more numbers and you use more of their products which they have. Uh, so I'm not, don't mistake me that I am advocating that you use more or you use uh, more than what is necessary. You choose because then that uh, because then that way the value of the patients goes down, or your colleagues might not see you in a good light, and your own value will go down. Do what is necessary, but do it well, so that would create a value for all the people. Surgical skill, a lot of people believe that if I operate, then only I become a good surgeon. More I operate, better surgeon I become. If I assist, I may not become that good surgeon. Remember, there are three components to surgical skill training. One is, of course, the skill. What you cut, what you suture, these are the basic things. See, these skills are not very difficult to develop. Uh, these things, you have to do it all your lives. So this skill is never going to leave you you can practice it on bench. You can practice it in, uh, uh, you can practice this uh, skill as to where the needle goes, where it comes out, uh, how you hold the tissue and all these things. You can practice even while doing the most basic uh, skin suturing. You need not do a vascular anastomosis, coronary vascular anastomosis to practice the skill. Hand-eye coordination will come. What takes time is the concentration. If you don't, if you are, don't have that ability to concentrate for the long periods of time, you are likely to make mistakes. So this concentration is so important for you. You should develop it. So when you are assisting a surgery, your eye should not leave the surgical field. It shouldn't wander here and there. Your eye should not leave the surgical field. The mind should not leave the surgical field. You every small step with the surgeon does should be recorded like a video in your brain. And whatever mistakes are there also should be recorded as a video so that you don't do it. And remember why when do mistakes occur? Mistakes don't occur in surgery because of lack of skill. Mistakes don't occur because of that. Mistakes occur because you take the wrong decision. A decision is taken to cut the wrong place. A decision is made to make give an incision without knowing what is there within. A decision is uh, a decision is made wrong when you fail to identify the right plane and make a uh, entry into a wrong plane, knowing fully well that I have not delineated the plane properly. So that's where decision making is so important. And decision making can be learned. You, you know, it's different than skill. Decision making is something which, if you want to learn yourself, it's by yourself. It's it's a bit long. That's why even when you are assisting somebody, you in your mind you vet their decision. Is he making the right decision or the wrong? If he makes right, you are learning how to make a right decision. If he is making a wrong decision, you know how to make a right decision now. You know what is the wrong decision and how you can make a right one is something which you will learn then as well. And remember. A decision making will go wrong when you lose concentration as well. So always develop concentration as well. So never ever, dear surgical friends, uh, never ever think that assisting is a waste of time because it will always give you a chance to develop your skill. But most importantly, it will give you a chance to develop your concentration and your decision making. So a uh, lot of people say that uh, another very criticism from uh, people is that there is a lot of competition from the interventionists. Uh, uh, 
uh, the, the cardiologists may be closer than they appear. They are always on to you. They are taking away your stent. By stenting, they are taking away all CABGs. And uh, the radiologists are doing all the very close veins and uh, uh, so many interventions. The pulmonologist is putting stents or they are pouring the bronchial tumors and all those things. No, you have to look back and see that the cardiologist is... But tell me, how many of you drive looking into... While it is good to be cautious, you shouldn't drive by looking only into the rear view mirror. You have to drive by looking into what is the road ahead. And for road ahead, what is the road ahead for the CVTS uh, uh, specialty, my dear friends? The road ahead is full of opportunities. If you can go this way, that way, the other way, one more way... There are full of avenues which you have to, which are waiting for you. You, may, you don't believe it? Let me tell you one. Let, let me come with a simple but very fundamental thing. Whatever is treated now surgically will all eventually go into some medical treatment. And whatever is a medical condition earlier will come back to surgical treatment. Let me give you an example. And in, if you think this is not enough, then you have various... Uh, Shady people uh, vying, I mean, you will have uh, to fight for the patient's attention for a surgical treatment with uh, all kinds of uh, quackery or all sorts of uh, claims and all sorts of uh, bizarre things. Now, why do I say this? See, uh, uh, earlier there was no treatment for, uh, for valve failure. It was supposed to be certain death. Then with great difficulty, they found earlier, it's, you, they would say, angina, there's no treatment boss. We just take these medications. Then they came up with a surgical treatment for that. We do valve replacements, we do valve repairs, we do bypass surgeries. Then but what is surgical may go into medical condition now. That uh, the probably putting stents, you may have better medications to come and you have better uh, medications for those conditions. So then what are the conditions which are being managed medically now? The medical conditions man being managed medically are congestive heart failure. Uh, they are uh, uh, heart failure, uh, mechanical pump failure. Uh, these were managed medically with just diuretics and uh, anti-failure measures. But now there are uh, we are putting doing transplants. We are putting uh, ventricular assist devices. Uh, we are doing pumps and all these things to treat these medical conditions. And these medical conditions have become surgical treatments. Okay, if you don't want to consider cardiac surgery, let me uh, take you back to uh, our previous era of general surgery or GI surgery where uh, one of the most common procedures on the list used to be vagotomies. No? Highly, highly selective vagotomies with pyloroplasty. Almost every patient used to have that. Every patient used to have a peptic ulcer. Where have all these cases? Uh, how many? I'm sure there are so many residents who have gone through their entire residency without seeing even a single vagotomy. And their teachers or their senior retired professors would not have an OT list without a vagotomy. Vagotomy became virtually surgical, suddenly became medical because of advent of uh, proton pump inhibitors. And what were medical like uh, management of uh, CA pancreas, management of uh, 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 management of uh, uh, malignancies in the pelvis. Well, these things suddenly became surgical with the advancement in uh, robotics, with the advancement in uh, laparoscopy, with the advancement in anesthetic techniques. What were once managed conservatively medically because nothing could be done for it, suddenly now have become surgical. So what has become surgical may become medical. What has become medical may be surgical. So my dear friends, Never say that, oh, this thing is going to make your condition obliterate because newer things will come into the gambit. Do we have the quality of life? Definitely. It isn't like earlier where people used to operate six sit next to the patient, watch drops of urine, watch how much is the bleeding and all. All these procedures standardized and safe now. <clears throat> no, while cardiac surgery has become standardized and safe, the risk factors in other surgeries have become more because if you look at some uh, onco surgery or plastic surgery, comorbidities have increased so much. Those patients have become sicker. You know, if, if you do an abdominal surgery, uh, you are left with the same stresses like the cardiac surgeons have. 
uh, while cardiac surgeons say, hey, is there a urine output or what is the cardiac output? <coughs> abdominal surgeons would say, has the bowel moved? Uh, are the bowel sounds present? Is the abdomen distended? Is there, are the fluid in the drain, abdominal drain, is it pus or is it just regular fluid? Plastic surgeons have said, has a flap taken up or do I have to revise it? Or uh, uh, orthopedic surgeons may say, has the bone healed well or not? Or a renal transplant surgeon may say, is there a urine output or is there a, a incontinence in that? So there are so many, even in other specialties now, these uh, complexities are there. Whereas in cardiac surgery, this has become much more easier now. Uh, surgeries have become much more standardized. So, so many people just operate in the morning, have a happy uh, game of carom after they have done with their surgeries and then go happily home. Uh, one more thing, you know, uh, it's a bit odd to say that, but one option which really cardiac surgery gives is you can be an aggressive private practitioner itself. You have a type of practice. You can be an aggressive private practitioner. Uh, you can just, uh, you can have another surgeon be the aggressive front of the patient, but you can operate his patients and thus have a meaningful but relaxed practice. Uh, you may just, uh, uh, you may have a relaxed practice as a cardiac surgeon, but still, uh, uh, still do extremely well. Or if you don't want any stress at all, you just assist somebody. That's it. Uh, he is more than happy to have a wonderful assistant. Uh, there is no stress on you at all. And uh, you are very much highly valued for your assistance. You won't believe it because that is so important in cardiac surgery as well to have a wonderful person in front of you. Uh, and then above all, uh, the, this is one specialty where you, you go anywhere in the world, you have open doors for you. You can have a choice of country, you can have a choice of city, you can have the tier one, tier two cities, you can have a big corporate hospital, or you can have a smaller hospital where you can just manage uh, certain vascular cases or certain chest trauma or other things. So you literally have the whole choice for yourselves. <laughs> when it comes to remuneration, let me tell you one thing. My PGs are definitely one of the highly paid postgraduates when they go out. This is because uh, they are well trained. They can do certain procedures which others can't do. And that's what makes them even more difficult to replace. You know, when it comes to a lot of other surgeries can be replaced by other specialty people. For example, uh, uh, there is so much of convergence or there is so much of competition between urologists, pediatric surgeons, general surgeons, uh, oncosurgeons. They are all competing for the same pie. But when a cardiac surgeon, when a cardiothoracic and vascular surgeon joins the team, he adds to that pie. That is why he adds, brings value to the organization. He is not competing with anybody else, but he is adding value to the organization. And that's why they are always compensated more. So most vacancies are there for very good cardiac surgeons. If you are well-trained, especially if you can do, say, maybe lung transplants or heart transplants or ventricular resist devices and all, these are extreme high-end jobs and they are, they are paid through the roof. I know people who get paid like, uh, oh, I can't even mention what you name your, they're probably one of the highest paid in our uh, specialties now in the medical fraternity now. Uh, one thing is uh, that a uh, lot of thoracic, vascular, and to a lot of extent cardiac, uh, you are now controlling the diagnostic as well as the therapeutic arms. And gone are the days when you'd say cardiologist has to refer a case, not anymore. Uh, you don't have to look around for patients because a hospital which has invested in an infrastructure, which has it's paying you well, will make sure that the patients come to you. There's no doubt about it. Uh, there are very few good cardiac surgeons around and uh, definitely patients, you don't have to compete uh, for patients like other specialties too. Uh, you don't have to go around with a laparoscopic set in your suitcase and go around public centers. Uh, that's, that will not be done. Uh, because uh, cardiac surgery is a big event in a patient's life. So, uh, whatever you say, the patient will uh, will just uh, hold on to you. So you have this wonderful ability to be an influencer in the patient's life. I'll come to that a bit later. But you have to, you are this wonderful influencer in a patient's life. So that's why it's a wonderful place to be in. And uh, nowadays, uh, with, the, with the advent of uh, CT coronary angiogram. Uh, with the advent of uh, other nuclear scans, with the advent of cardiac MRIs and all, 
uh, those uh, and with surgeons themselves picking up certain skills of echocardiography and other things. Uh, Nowadays, most of the diagnostic features are in your arms, and even the therapeutics are in your arms now. So it's a wonderful place to be. So as I was saying, you can be totally influence. You can be an influencer to the patient completely. Why? Because when a patient comes to you, uh, what is at stake? You know, uh, the no your knowledge, your time, and the patient's time. Uh, there is a certain amount of risk in a procedure. And of course, patient has to spend so much of money, and you have to spend so much of time. Uh, so there are so many things at stake. So uh, you can just be transactional, or you can be a trusted advisor and mentor. For example, I say, if a guy comes to me and say, "I have a headache," he can just say, "Take this paracetamol and blah off." That would make it transactional. He he does the same with a medical shop guy. He does the same with a nurse. He does the same with uh, any other private uh, RMP practitioner in your town as well. But then, as a doctor, you have to engage him in a more meaningful manner. Uh, probably, you should find out uh, whether, uh, uh, with your knowledge, with your background of uh, medicine, you can use that to know what are the trigger factors. You can probably find out what are the elevating factors. Uh, are these cluster headaches or are these? Uh, is this a form of trigeminal neuralgia? You have that knowledge because. Uh, but having said that, you should bring forth that knowledge for it. And then, if you are giving him paracetamol, you should it, it come with certain advisories that if it doesn't uh, reduce, uh, then this is the next thing we might want to do. Or if it uh, he has to take it at the onset of pain and not before it becomes too high because you want to break a cycle of pain. So. With these add-on benefits, what he would do, he try, he trusts you a bit more, and he says, "Okay, uh, next time I want, uh, next time I want to have uh, eye surgery done, I might, uh, I might come to him." You say, "I'm not an eye doctor." But say, "No, you you may not be an eye doctor, but I trust your judgment on it." Hmm? Uh, so you may say, "Okay, uh, but I don't know much about eye, but I know this particular doctor might be a good doctor for you." So yeah, fine, I, I'm. You know, just because you said that, I trust your advice, and I might go to that doctor. And if he has a good, uh, if he has a good experience with that, then trust me, he would come to you even for things non-medical. He might want to even come. Uh, I want to get my son married. I want to get my son into some uh, uh, next level of uh, career. What career should options should he take, or what is the kind of girl he wants to marry? So he would come to you for all things uh, as a mentor. So it takes a bit of engagement for you to develop that uh, relationship, and right from that uh, relationship being just transactional, you have to make it a bit more, and you should uh, be a trusted advisor to the patient. Finally, what makes the thoracic and vascular specialty really attractive? You know, there's a deluge of allied specialists. For every one cardiac surgeon which is, comes out. Uh, there are something like fifty or forty or fifty cardiologists who are coming out in every day, every year. Uh, there are some twenty, thirty pulmonologists who are coming out every year. Uh, there are some twenty, thirty radio intervention radiologists who are coming out every year. Uh, uh, they are trying their uh, hands in all sorts of things, getting into all sorts of messes, and they want a CVTS guy to bail them out. And there are very few CVTS guys in the market today. Trust me, there are very few. And if you look at, they virtually non-existent. Thoracic surgery, you won't believe it. Um, uh, in the whole of North India, you might you might find ten or twenty, fifteen centers in the whole of North India where they can do uh, uh, proper thoracic surgery. Uh, vascular surgeons, they they might just be a handful of places which do meaningful uh, vascular surgery. A uh, lot of people go to unqualified people. They go to poor people, uh, poor in terms of uh, ability and in terms of knowledge. Uh, they go to these, uh, you know, mm, why are people going to RMPs? Because they aren't really good doctors around them. So similarly, uh, probably some people are taking care of those needs, but there is a huge, huge gap, especially if you look at tier two towns, if you look at tier three cities. Uh, uh, so for example, uh, uh, every second day, I get a call from Jharkhand or Ranchi that uh, we need some surgeons in our place. Uh, uh, a city like Lucknow, which has a five crore population, hardly has one or two private sector uh, cardiac surgery institutes, which does cardiac surgery. Huh? Mm -hmm. uh, 
even bigger towns like Allahabad, even uh, uh, bigger places, uh, they have very few cardiac surgery centers. Uh, or decent tire to city. There are so many tire to cities who don't even have a cardiologist, so even have a cardiac surgeon within a within a radius of uh, 150 to 200 kilometers. So there is a huge demand. There's no doubt about it. Uh, the existing treatment, like uh, say coronary artery bypass surgeries or uh, lung resections, these are all gold standard. You know, uh, uh, no amount of stenting can. We've been hearing since I joined the specialty. They say this stent is going to make CABG ob, uh, ob, uh, obliviate, obliviate CABG surgery. What? Then some study says, which says, uh, scent is not inferior to, but it never shows that it is superior to. They said, no, we are coming with a different kind of stent that will be better. Then those different kind of stents have come, but they haven't matched uh, uh, CABG surgery. Say, no, okay, we are going to come with an even better quality of stent. That hasn't matched. So these they keep going, they keep threatening, but our treatments are gold standard. They are not likely to be replaced very soon. One biggest advantage is, uh, you see, when there was a generation of la young laparoscopic surgeons who quickly replaced the older, they used to say, big surgeons operate with big incisions. So all those uh, surgeons were immediately replaced by the laparoscopic era surgeons. And the lap surgeons were all young surgeons. So similarly, the newer guys, the newer cream of uh, surgeons who are going to come to the cardiac surgery, they are the ones who are more likely to go into minimally invasive or robotic cardiac surgery. And they are the ones who stand this wonderful opportunity of immediately replacing the old timers. So, uh, so you don't have to say this surgeon is an old surgeon and probably he has a better experience and I'll go to him. There might be some people like that, but uh, definitely there'll be a lot more people who say he's a young surgeon. He has good experience in the newest technologies and I want to go to him. So, or uh, both the young surgeon and the old surgeon have the same experience in these newer technologies. So I might as well go to the young surgeon because he's more accessible. He has better communication skills. He has better knowledge and wisdom and he's able to convince me better. So uh, this is a wonderful opportunity to leapfrog the uh, older surgeons who are already practicing and establish yourself really fast. Mind you, India is sitting, we already crossed infectious diseases as a cross of death 20 years ago. Uh, 60 to 70 percent of our population still suffers, uh, our causes of death are still uh, cardiovascular disease. The patient, we haven't even scratched the surface of patient population yet. Tire 2, tire 3 towns don't even have any work going on. We are the diabetic capital of the world. We are the hypertensive capital of the world. We are the obese capital of the world. Our patient population will just keep going exponentially. So, but what is not matching is the number of cardiac surgeons we are producing. It is so painful for me to say every year I get calls and calls and calls. There's a vacancy with us. There's a vacancy with us. And I'm sorry to say that, okay, we had these guys passed up, but they're all taken up and they've got excellent things, the options in hand. So then I get make enemies because why didn't you put us as the number one choice? <laughs> so they have, they're spoiled for choice. And now <clears throat> even the students can pick up a center of choice for training because, uh, uh, because there's relatively less competition so you have this uh, uh, seats have been increased exponentially. So you have this choice to come to work and get trained with this particular surgeon. I want to get, uh, I want to do this work. So this center is the best place for, so you might say this center is the best place for vascular surgery. I want to be a vascular surgeon. So let me go and work with this person. Or this uh, surgery center does extremely good amount of VAT surgery. So let me go and say, train myself there. Or this place does fantastic coronary work. Let me go there. So you have this choice uh, of, uh, you can pick up this choice uh, for uh, uh, training a, a proper center of your choice. Um, this is because the number of seats have increased exponentially and competitors are still less. So this opportunity is there. So finally, my dear friends, uh, when you have finished your uh, general surgery and if you're looking for CVTS as an option, 
But even if you're not looking for CVTS as an option, uh, I would like to suggest that keep an open mind. Uh, visit a center of your choice. Uh, if you want to say do oncosurgery, visit a oncocenter surgery center of your choice. Visit a cardiac surgery center of your choice as well. Uh, just see what you are likely to, because this is something you. This is something which you have to be with for the rest of your life. Um, you don't marry on your first blind date, right? So why should you check? It? Why should you? You won't marry a first blind date just because somebody said this is a good girl, this is a good guy, right? Uh, so similarly, you wouldn't want to uh, marry a specialty which you have to live with for the rest of your life without really knowing what it is about. Uh, be it anyway. So, uh, so similarly, a, a good cardiac surgery center is something which you should all visit uh, either in your general surgery days or even otherwise when you're planning. Most of the surgeons will welcome where most of your surgeons should welcome young guys who want to make a career choice so if you come in you see what uh, it looks like and then you definitely have to plan a career path you should have a roadmap otherwise uh, uh, your career goes nowhere you should definitely find the right mentors who have who who will guide you the right way uh, never work for a mean boss. I said that again and again. Always work for people who teach you, from whom you might learn, who is skillful, who doesn't mind sharing his uh, skills with you. Uh, above all, you should enjoy what you do. That's paramount. Uh, be it cardiac surgery or be it any other specialty, you really have to enjoy. And uh, my suggestion is uh, that uh, you are the ones to take these specialties forward. Uh, you are the ones to take the surgical specialties forward. So spend, uh, spend some time in basic research, spend some time interacting with technology, spend some time interacting with the industry, mm, learn a few tricks, give them a few suggestions which would make things better and uh, spend some time in basic research and technology as well. So only if you do all these things, uh, you know, uh, we always uh, compare uh, cardiac surgery to a flight. Why? Because number one, we do all these checklists and uh, going on a cardiopulmonary bypass machine, the risk is supposed to be the same as that of a flight. Uh, so similarly, um, I would say that uh, when you are looking for a career in uh, cardiovascular and thoracic surgery, uh, I would like to have that uh, the certain checklist I would like you to make uh, certain uh, certain things I would like you to invest in. And then once you are set, I wish you have a very, very safe flight. My dear friends, do plan for a CBTS degree. There will be a wonderful career waiting ahead for you. I'm free to accept any questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Rao, for this insightful lecture. I am sure our young and budding leaders would highly benefit from your talk. Uh, moving ahead, I have a couple of questions for you. So my first question is, the mortality in CTVS is higher on paper. So do you think this should be a hindrance to students who wish to pursue CTVS as a speciality? Uh, this is a myth which we need to strongly, for, which we need to strongly, uh, what do you say, uh, uh, blast. Uh, mortality used to be higher in CVTS. Uh, when, we, when the specialty started, uh, there was a 20 to 30% mortality. People used to bleed heavily. They used to wait with uh, adrenaline drips. They used to count the drops of adrenaline drips there. Uh, that was the kind of specialty when it started. And uh, that's what. That's why they say cardiac surgery separates the boys from the men. They used to say that. Uh, so they were, uh, it was so daunting. And that's the myth which is perpetuated. And that's why we have fewer people. But now it has changed so much. Uh, people have invested so much, so much into the uh, into their uh, art and science. They have reported so much. They have taught each other so much that what used to be 20, 30 percent came down to two to three percent, and now it is less than one percent. Uh, like last year, I, when I did bypass, I have less than one percent mortality. Uh, and at the same time, when you compare other specialties, like say. Uh, as I said, oncosurgery or plastic surgery or any other specialties, uh, the people who are coming into those, the patients who are coming to the, into those specialties, they are all having so many more comorbidities. 
like uh, a bariatric surgery guy has to not, not just deal with just bariatric surgery he has to deal with the whole uh, whole body uh, endocrine this that all, all that and what is worse is it is cardiac surgeons control so much of the ecosystem but a bariatric surgeon he just knows only how to clip the stomach and then he is they are left at the mercy of the intensivists so we don't know whether they are good bad or not uh, or if you have a cancer surgeon the cancer surgeon might uh, have a cancer patient the cancer patient might have received 3 4 6 cycles of chemotherapy some radiotherapy and then uh, old age copd coronary artery disease uh, old uh, hip replacement and uh, what do you have what have you can you say that you will uh, the patient will pass uh, smoothly uh, so and to some extent cardiac surgery patients accept a death once in a while with cardiac surgery but they wouldn't accept a death of an mrm of a uh, of some um, breast surgery even with so many comorbidities mm. so uh, it's definitely not daunting it's definitely not a negative aspect anymore uh, there are so many ways by which uh, surgeries have become safer uh, only thing is you have to make sure is uh, that only when you get trained properly do can you make that assessment and can you explain those right kind of, right kind of risk to the patients thank you so much sir uh, moving ahead my next question is it is said that in ctvs settlement takes time when peers in non medical streams may be at their pinnacle of glory how should a student or a budding surgeon deal with this uh, i have addressed this uh, see uh, uh, settlement means you might want a ready job at a center uh, at a city of your choice uh, with a, a salary package which you would like at that stage of your career cvts offers all of these uh, if today i want a job in hyderabad delhi bombay pune or if i want a job in new york uh, london new york singapore or if i want a job in ranchi dehradun bhopal indore or if i want a job in uh, where uh, kannauj or uh, varanasi you name a place there is only one specialty where people will be waiting with open arms for a job and that is cvts you will be paid well i i know onco surgeons who have passed from centers like tata for working on 25000 rupees can you believe it my, i pay my driver more than that huh? so uh, so it's a myth that some uh, jobs make money and some don't you have a ready job waiting for you in cvds second is uh, would you get uh, uh, is the learning curve too steep it isn't anymore uh, you are working with very good surgeons now very skilled surgeons now all these uh, young surgeons who pass out they are smart kids they can pick up these surgeries well they, there is a lot of opportunity for you to practice on bench these things you need not practice all surgeries on the patients so before a guy does a, 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 a does a cabg surgery on the heart he gets plenty of opportunities to practice these anastomoses uh, by doing av fistulas uh, by practicing uh, with vein bits on the bench by practicing with uh, bovine uh, on bovine hearts um, or uh, these there the plenty of ways to practice now uh, there are plenty of ways to fast track your career and as again as i said uh, you get into minimally invasive cardiac surgery or you get into transplant surgery uh, you get into lvads you immediately leap from over uh, a guy with 20 years of cardiac surgery practice because these are newer technologies he can't compete with you anymore you immediately leap frog over them tell me a plastic surgeon who can leap frog another plastic surgeon by 20 years you can't tell me an onco surgeon who can leap frog over another guy by 20 years you can't hmm? only cardiac surgery is offering that that window was there for other specialties few years back that window has come to cardiac surgery now this is the golden era of cardiac surgery i remember when i was a student nobody wanted uh, a few years before i i i actually passed out nobody wanted to take anesthesia because they say mortality is high it is uh, such a painstaking job and a thankless job suddenly when we were passing out and when we took mle scores people wanted anesthetists all over the place mm, i remember my medical school uh, there were no takers for dv dermatology and venereal diseases no takers to the pink crores of rupees as donation to get one hmm? nobody wanted to do psychiatry look at how much psychiatry is in demand now 
So if you think nobody wants to do cardiac surgery now, I'll tell you there are in so much in demand. There are so much in demand. You will have a very wonderful career and some don't even require that training curve. Uh, if Why are my postgraduates uh, so getting such good offers? Because we train them in lung surgery. And lung, the moment they say we, do, we can do lung surgery as well, oh my God, come on. We, we want somebody who can do that. We have nobody who does that. If you say, I can do vascular surgery as well. I can, uh, I can consult a vascular. I can see a patient with gangrene. Fantastic. Oh my God, we have nobody to do that. Come on board. So uh, you will have a wonderful career. There is no doubt about it. Thank you so much. Uh, my next question is, there could be times where HOD latches on to his or her post doing a major chunk of the surgeries. This proving it difficult for upcoming surgeons to gain access to more hands-on training. So how should a junior surgeon pave his way to get more hands-on experience? So I, I would want you to share your experience for the same. Again, as I said, uh, number one, uh, uh, the way cardiac surgery environment or ecosystem is structured today, uh, one of the best things is you have your choice. You have a cafeteria choice. Right? Um, I can actually pick up which center I want to get trained in. I can actually get to pick which boss I can work with. Because uh, if he's a bad boss, I can say I don't want to because I have options. Uh, when there are, uh, when there are, when last year 130 seats vacant, got, went vacant, it is because a lot of these people were not doing meaningful work. Or not, a lot of these people were not uh, training their students well. Uh, but with a reasonable score, you can get into AIMS, you can get into NIMS, you can get into Chitra, you can get into a place of your choice, which has either reputation or if you want to work with a particular boss, you can pick your uh, bosses now. Uh, similarly, when it comes to a job, they will always see a good boss will always mentor his students and send them on independently or send them on to fellowships abroad or send them off to good places to work in even in India. So those places are always there and you can always pick your right choice of uh, bosses. Even if you land up with a bad boss who doesn't give you enough chances, as I said, the basic skills you will always learn. Uh, you know, uh, uh, cutting and suturing is something which you will learn on bench or even while doing the menial tasks. What is most important is to build that concentration and build decision-making skills. That is something which will come only when you spend time at the operating table, whether you are assisting or whether you are doing it yourself. So there is no shortcut to it either, even if you are doing it or even if you are assisting it. So uh, even if you are working with a boss who doesn't really offer you surgery, you still have a lot of, uh, you have. You should have faith in your ability, faith in your knowledge and faith in your concentration and judgment that the moment you get to do surgery, you are going to do a good job. Thank you so much, sir, for answering these questions. If we have any more questions, we'll get back to you. Any closing statements for our viewers watching us live here? Uh, of course, uh, uh, one of the biggest lessons I have learned uh, at ISB was, uh, I put it as a slide, that there is an opportunity in every imperfection. Uh, uh, today, uh, we have to seize those imperfections and seize those opportunities. And uh, the old, it is medicine, practice of medicine or surgery is no longer what it used to be in the past. Uh, you have to be an influencer. Uh, it is no longer to just be competent. You have to be an influencer. Uh, it is not enough if I'm just uh, if I'm just a good surgeon in Nizams, which is a training institute. Uh, why are dark plexus? I should be able to reach out to some young surgeons and get the best attracted to my specialty. So it's not enough that I just put suture to suture. I should have good communication skills. I should be. I should take the patient into my confidence. Patient who should have my conf complete confidence and satisfaction in me. It's a lot of hard work and it is a work in process. So uh, don't go by what uh, some, I would say, losers would uh, want to uh, you know, uh, say that this is good, this is not good. There is nothing like a, this branch has scope and this branch doesn't have scope. Uh, there was a time when you say anatomy doesn't have scope or physiology doesn't have scope. Would you buy that now? I don't think so. Every branch has good, meaningful jobs if you are good and competent. And the best of branches, if you're not good and competent, you don't stand a chance anywhere. 
so while there may be so many uh, networking uh, doctor networking places around if you're on doc plexus you're probably good <laughs> if you're not <laughs> so uh, so uh, i think you should keep that in mind there is more premium on expertise there's more premium on knowledge rather than uh, you know on what sub specialty you choose follow your heart for that thank you so much dr rao uh, you are such a passionate teacher mentor and i'm sure your team is very lucky to have you thank you so much for gracing our platform for being the speaker for today hoping to interact with you again very very soon it's always a pleasure to work with young talent uh, it is such a pleasurable thing i wish you all the best uh, dear viewers this is a new series started in association with our knowledge partners marian cardiac center and research foundation so do write to us if you have any feedback or specific ask for topics of discussion until we see you again Please uh, take care and have a great weekend ahead. Thank you so much.